Okay, now that we've gone over the anatomy of the GI system, we're going to start into the radiographic procedures and the positioning for each of the um, four different areas. So we're going to start with the esophagus to begin. And the projections that we do are AP or PA, and sometimes we do both, um, AP or PA oblique, and a lateral, and it's normally a right lateral, but it can be left. Uh, what we're looking for with the esophagus for your evaluation criteria is um, evidence of proper collimation. Um, when you're using a 14 by 17, you're going to leave it open to the length of the 17, but you're going to collimate in from the 14. 14 is too wide to be doing an esophagram, so you're going to need to take it into about 6 inches um, wide, and you should be able to catch all of the uh, esophagus with that at the 6 inches. So that's typically what I want to see. I don't want to see it wide open on a 14 by 17. The 17 likewise, yes, unless it's a small person, I expect you to collimate up if it's a really small petite person. So you need to have collimation and the esophagus from the lower part of the neck um, to its entrance into the stomach. So you need to see the entire esophagus. Typically we go from um, the upper level of the teeth all the way through into the entrance into the stomach. You need to see the esophagus completely filled with barium. It's not okay if it's just in the top portion or just in the middle or just in the distal portion. You need to get the whole entire esophagus filled. And the way that you do that is you have the patient in the position, you give them the cup with the straw, and you tell them drink, 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 drink. Big swallows, keep drinking, keep drinking, keep drinking as you take the exposure. So you want them to get down four or five really big swallows of barium right when you expose. You also need to make sure that you're using the proper technique in order to penetrate the barium. And this goes for all the views um, within the whole GI system. It's really important that you up your KVP so that you can um, see through that barium. So on your AP or PA esophagus, um, Preliminary uh, patient prep is not required. Uh, you can do this without any patient prep. You can use single or double contrast. So single, um, you can use barium or water soluble or iodinated. Um, double contrast, you're gonna use barium and carbon dioxide crystals. And when you use the crystals, what you're gonna do um, is you are going to have thick and thin barium. Uh, so you're going to give the carbon dioxide crystals typically with a shot of water, just a little teeny bit of water, or with the thick barium. Um, sometimes the doctors have you mix it together with the thick barium or drop the crystals into the water and have the patient shoot them down. I always tell the patient it's like drinking a, a can of soda really fast, so it's going to make you feel like you want to burp. Don't burp. We need that air in there in order to see the lining really well. So the first part of the examination is the fluoroscopy of swallowing, and the doctor does these images. They're going to take several images looking at the upper, middle, and lower portion of the esophagus with it filled with barium and with it stripped of barium. And they want to see the tertiary contractions to make sure that um, there is no tertiary contractions, that the um, mobility of the esophagus is working properly. If it's um, disjointed in how it's pushing the barium down, we call that tertiary contractions. They're dismobile. Um, they're not flowing as they're supposed to. So here we go into the projections that you would take once the radiologist is complete. Um, you are going to position the patient either supine or uh, prone uh, without any rotation. So this is for your AP or PA. You're going to have them turn the head to the side to facilitate drinking. So the IR is placed so that the top is level with the mouth. The central ray is perpendicular to the midpoint of the IR, and you're going to be at about T5, T6 for your positioning landmark, and you're going to collimate again. So this is what you're going to be looking at. This is not high enough. You need to be a little bit higher, so I'm not real happy with this image. But here's your esophagus coming down and draining into the stomach. So um, you could have come up a little bit so that you could see all of this and you can see we've got barium filled we have some air in there also so okay so with your AP or PA oblique esophagus um, the patient position recumbent with a 35 to 40 degree right anterior oblique so this is going to be your RAO or you're going to do an LPO 
So um, those are your two uh, different views that you're going to do. A lot of the times we'll start with LPO, we'll go right lateral, and then we'll go REO. So we'll do those three views, um, very common. So LPO, right lateral, REO, all drinking. Okay, so align the IR and the elevated side of the patient approximately two inches lateral to the MSP. The CR enters perpendicular to the midpoint of the IR, so at the MSP, you're going to go two inches lateral at the level of T5, T6. You're going to collimate it down again. So here you go. Here's general position and T5, T6, two inches lateral. Um, oh, here at this slide, I wanted to show you guys the normal indentation. So coming down your um, esophagus, you remember you have the cardiac notch, you have your pulmonary uh, notch and you have aortic notch, pulmonary notch, and your cardiac notch. So here you go again. Here's your aortic notch, your pulmonary notch, and your cardiac notch. So um, you can see on the different views from the AP to the oblique to the lateral, you can see your aortic notch. Um, can't really see your pulmonary notch, but you can see your cardiac, how the imprint of your um, heart has on your esophagus. So looking here, this is your um, RAO position. This is a single contrast. And coming down, you can see how it's thrown off the spine, which is good. And it's almost completely filled with barium. And you can see there's a little sliding hiatal hernia. You can see the rugae right there. This is it filled with air. Um, it's important for the radiologist to see this. If this was one of your images, you failed, you need to go back and have them really drink, 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 so that you can get that full of barium but it's a good picture of it um, for an air contrast study. Here we go this is a uh, um, REO and oh this one is the yep REO so coming down you've got barium coming all the way down so this is a pretty good shot you're right up top all the way down into the stomach and it's collimated nicely. Here we go so this one is the um, LPO and we almost have it all the way down pretty good it's not emptying yet We've got some air bubbles in there this here is a spot film showing esophageal varices so in the pathology class you're going to see this you can see the worm like deep folds here so this is esophageal varices it's usually from portal hypertension from uh, cirrhosis of the liver so it backs up these can rupture and the patients can bleed out this right here is called a Schatzky's ring. So this little indentation is called Schatzky's. So um, we just call it Schatzky's. You can um, call it Schatzky's ring to be more technically correct. Um, and what that indicates is a sliding hiatal hernia. So um, that little ring there. Okay, so your lateral esophagus. Um, Patient position, you're going to be recumbent right or left, lateral. Um, patients should face the radiographer, so whatever position they're in so that they're facing you, you're going to have the arms coming forward out of the uh, mid-coronal plane. So your uh, central ray is um, entering perpendicular to the midpoint of the IR, which is along the mid-coronal plane. So you're going to enter mid-coronal plane at T5, T6. So everything on the esophagus, so your three views are going to be at T5, T6. So you got your AP, uh, your obliques, and your lateral. So like I said, the typical um, positioning that we would do would be um, AP or PA, however the doctor left the patient. And then we go LPO, right lateral, and REO. Those were our standard uh, protocols. If you do that, you're probably going to be okay. If the patient's left in a PA position, you can start with that and roll them up into REO, right lateral, and an LPO. If you do those views, you're pretty well covered. Okay, so here's what a lateral esophagram looks like here. So make sure the arms are forward. If you have the arms just down by the side, as you can see, it would be right in your esophagus. So this is open pretty wide. I'd like to see it a lot tighter so you guys can see here it can be coned down quite a bit. So the stomach, so um, we refer to it as a GI study or a upper GI series. Um, I usually call it an upper <laughs> or upper GI. So you're gonna do a scout um, of the kidneys, urinaries, and bladders, but your KUB is gonna be a higher KUB. It's gonna be centered higher. Um, we wanna see the diaphragm and see if the stomach 
is um, up into the chest. So you need to make sure you get a couple inches at least of the lung fields. So um, fluoroscopic and series radiograph studies of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum using uh, contrast is normal. So the radiologist is going to usually do an esophagram, then look at the stomach, and then look at the duodenum. Um, pay close attention to the duodenum. There's a lot of pathologies that can happen down in the duodenum. So um, let's see. Sometimes we'll even follow that with a small bowel. Patient prep, so the stomach has to be empty. So we usually want it free of gas and fecal material that can't obscure things. So um, food and water withheld for eight to nine hours before the exam. If small exam, uh, small intestines is also going to be uh, followed by the upper GI, food is withheld the evening before. So make sure you talk to your patients and make sure there's no nicotine or gum or anything um, Sometimes they suck on life savers or mints. Um, that'll stimulate gastric secretions and um, your, your barium's not gonna stick to the walls of um, the mucosal lining. So it's important that they don't have any of that. So there's single and double contrast. It's the same thing for the esophagram. So you can do double contrast includes barium and gas and it's gonna be the same idea. Um, we can also do pills to see any kind of strictures anywhere. Um, it's important that the patient doesn't burp up any of the gas. There's the biphasic examination or the combination single and double during the same procedures where we're doing both. Um, so we may do a single real quick and make sure nothing's grossly abnormal and then we can proceed with the double contrast. Very common uh, when we're doing the esophagram to do the biphasic. We want to make sure that there's no aspiration before we give them any crystals. Because if they're aspirating the crystals, um, they're going to cough and cough and cough and cough and cough. It's, it's not a good thing. Um, and then the hypertonic and uh, duog duogenorphy is uh, something I've never done. So I have no idea what it is. All right. So usually begin an upper GI with the patient in that bright position. Uh, the radiologist may examine the heart and lungs um, with fluoro and determine whether the stomach is empty or not. So um, the radiologist, they, each one does something different. If those of you have residents, you'll see that it's even more different. So the radiologist will instruct the patient to drink, and you're going to hand them all the different cups. Um, the esophagus is examined with the first two or three swallows. We're going to make sure that the patient's not aspirating and that there's no strictures going into the stomach. So spot films are made, so you need to make sure that everything's set up for the radiologist. And um, uh, manual manipulation used to coat the gastric mucosa. So what happens is the patient's going to drink all the stuff. We're going to lay the patient down, and you got to be able to roll that patient around and around in reverse order and back around so they're doing um, 360s on the table so that we're able to coat their whole stomach. Um, it's important that we see the whole stomach mixed with the um, CO2 and the, um, the barium. So you got to move the patient all around, and then you're going to have the uh, patient drink, as the radiologist says, and takes, he, they're going to be taking spot films. So the examination determines the size, the shape, the position of the stomach. So it's really important that you pay attention to where the radiologist is taking these images. Based on the somatotype of the patient, um, they could be stenic, hypersthenic, asthenic, and the stomach is going to lie in a completely different position. So you need to make sure you pay attention to where the stomach is so when you're doing your overheads, you have an idea exactly where you're going to be uh, centering. So um, we're going to look at the peristalsis, the filling and emptying of the duodenal bulb, the abnormalities in function and contour of the anatomy to make sure there's no um, pathologies within there. The following slides describe the patient positioning for the overhead um, after the radiologist is done. Typically, the radiologist will leave the fluoro tower over the stomach so you'll know where the stomach is. So. Before you um, even start the exam, these are some of the things you want to keep in mind. So you, keep, uh, you need to find out the clinical history of the patient, the body habitus, so you know exactly where you're going to be centering. So um, pay attention when the radiologist is doing that study. Identify uh, positioning landmarks while the doctor is doing the study. Um, make sure the KVP is high um, so that you can penetrate the barium. Like I said, uh, typically I set the barium or the KVP for the barium at like one, 105 to 110. If the patient's really big, I'll go up to 115. 
do a exp short exposure time and help with the uh, motion. So when you start your, your portion, you'll know where the stomach is. You already be set for your high KVP and short exposure time to control that involuntary motion. And what you're going to be doing, typically you're going to do a scout as of the higher abdomen. Then after the doctor's done with his procedure, you're going to do a PA, a PO, PA oblique, an AP oblique, a lateral, and an AP. So when we're looking at barium within the stomach and where it lies, if you're looking here, if air is black and barium is white, um, here on a supine, barium is going to fill the, sum, the fundus. And here, air is going to fill the fundus if you are prone and erect. So air is going to float to the top. So the stomach lies within the body in an oblique plane um, from anterior to posterior. So um, it's important that you do all the views properly so that the barium and the air are in the proper places so that the radiologist can see the whole stomach when you're doing your overheads. So if we're doing a PA stomach, um, they can be recumbent or upright. So you're going to align the midline of the grid to the mid-satchel plane passing halfway between the vertebral column and the left lateral border of the abdomen. So you're going to uh, center the IR one to two inches above the lower uh, rib margin, so at the level of L1, L2. Um, and upright requires centering of three to six inches lower, so you have to drop it down. So here, uh, your CR is perpendicular to the center of the IR. You're going to collimate to a 10 by 12. Um, if the stomach, if they're asthenic, clearly you're going to have to turn the cassette so that you can get the whole um, stomach on there. And then you're going to have them blow their air all the way out so it's on suspended expiration. What we're looking for on a PA is evidence of proper collimation. You need to make sure that you've collimated to the stomach. The entire stomach and proximal duodenum is on there. The stomach is centered at the level of the pylorus and exposure technique that shows the anatomy. And the body and the pylorus are barium filled and air in the fundus. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this looks a little low to me. Uh, probably bring it up a bit and that doesn't look like a 10 by 12. <laughs> so I wanted to put this in here so that you could see PA of the stomach and I would be up here probably with my centering and this does not look like a 10 by 12. I would take it here, right? So it depends on where the stomach is. If they're asthenic, like I said, it's going to be all the way down here. So it just depends on the body type. Okay, so this looks like an asthenic patient. So it's nice and long. Um, yeah, so here you go. And you want to be collimated as best you can. Here is a patient that is hypersthenic. You can see how the stomach comes across. So you, between the two, you can see that there is a big difference depending on the body type on where the stomach is going to be um, positioned within the body. This is a hypersthenic patient and an hyposthenic patient. Big difference, huh? All right, so PA oblique of the stomach and duodenum. So this is your RAO. So you're going to um, position the part, so midline of the IR is aligned with the sagittal plane, passing midway between the vertebral column and the lateral border of the elevated side. So the IR is centered to the lower rib margin, so level of um, L1-2. Um, adjust the rotation to 40 to 70 degrees to demonstrate the pyloric canal and duodenum. And it depends on the body type of the patient on how much you're gonna go. So the CR is perpendicular to the IR and you should be on a 10 by 12. The exposure is made on suspended expiration. What we're looking for is evidence of proper collimation. The entire stomach and duodenal loop is there. The superimposition of the pylorus and the no superimposition of the pylorus and the duodenal bulb. The duodenal bulb and loop are in profile. The stomach is centered at the level of the pylorus and exposure technique that shows the anatomy. So here's your position and here's what it looks like. So you have the fundus, the greater curvature, lesser curvature. Here's your pylorus and your duodenal bulb. So perfect. 
Um, here we are with the fundus and um, you can see here it's filled with barium so it's a little hard to see through there. Okay, AP oblique of the stomach, so this is your LPO. So you have the uh, line midline with the IR with the sagittal plane passing midway between the vertebral column and the left lateral border of the abdomen. Center the IR to a point midway between the xiphoid process and the lower ribs. Adjust rotation to 30 to 60 degrees, so the average is 45. So your CR uh, to the midpoint of the IR, you're going to use a 10 by 12 again, and the exposure is made on expiration. What we're looking for is proper collimation, the entire stomach and duodenal oh, loop, that's interesting. Um, the fundic portion of the stomach is, should be there. No superimposition of the pylorus and duodenal bulb, the, the body and the stomach uh, centered on the image and the exposure technique that shows the anatomy, the body in the pyloric antrium with the double contrast visual, visualization. So here's your positioning right here. So on the arms, when you're doing your LPO, you're going to bring the arm behind the other one up at the pillow. And when you're doing the REO, the arm is going to be down by the side with the other one up holding the cup. So here, um, here's the position for LPO. You can see we've got air in here in the pylorus, whereas on the um, REO, you saw it was barium filled. So your fundus is filled with barium and you have the body and the pylorus um, with air contrast. So the lateral stomach and duodenum um, patient position, you have the recumbent right lateral, demonstrates the right retrogastric space, the duodenal loop, and the duodenal jejunal junction. The upright left lateral position demonstrates the left retrogastric space. We typically do a right lateral. So part position, align the plane passing midway between the uh, MCP and the anterior surface of the abdomen to midline of the grid, center the IR at the level of L2, L1, L2 uh, for recumbent and L3 for the upright. And make sure you're in a true lateral position. So the CR is centered to the IR and you're gonna use a 10 by 12 again and you're going to be on expiration. We're looking for evidence of proper collimation, the entire stomach and duodenal loop is on, no rotation of the patient is shown by the spine and the stomach center at the level of pylorus and the exposure technique that shows the anatomy. So pretty consistent all the way through. And this is your positioning here depending on your body type. And actually, um, you're gonna wanna be a little more anterior than mid-coronal plane depending on the size of the patient. Um, as you can see here, they're a little more anterior than mid-coronal plane. Um, so the spine is posterior. Sometimes the stomach will go way back, um, the fundus posterior with the spine. So um, make sure that you are opened up so that you can cover all of it depending on the patient's body type. So here you are. Um, so this one, the fundus is, sometimes the fundus is back here. So it just depends. So here's your fundus, here's your body, and your duodenal bulb is here with your um, duodenum there. Okay, so AP stomach, so patient supine, and this one we're gonna use to check for a reflex or a hiatal hernia. So what you're gonna wanna do is angle the table towards the head. So make sure the patient's on the table so that you can angle um, the table down, it's called Trendelenburg, to see if there's any reflex or hiatal hernia. So you're going to line the midline to the grid um, to MSP. You use a 14 by 17. Um, you can use a 10 by 12 um, aligned to the um, sagittal plane passing midway between MSP and the left lateral margin of the abdomen. Um, if you do the 10 by 12, um, the IR to the level midway between the xiphoid and the lower ribs. On a 14 by 17, it can be adjusted to demonstrate more diaphragm or small bowel. So typically what we'll do is we'll, we'll go up about two, three inches above the diaphragm. Uh, so like mid sternum and we'll get the small bowel to see if there's any abnormality in the small bowel. So when I do this shot, I typically don't use a 10 by 12. I use a 14 by 17 because I want to see 
one, if there's a hiatal hernia with reflux, and two, if there's anything going on in the small bowel. Okay, so you're going to, um, your CR is perpendicular to the IR, and then a 10 by 12, you're gonna be collimated to the stomach for 14 by 17, you're gonna do the stomach and the small bowel, and it's your exposure is done on expiration. What we're looking for is evidence of proper collimation, so you don't wanna have it wide open to include everything. Um, you want to see the entire stomach and duodenal loop for double contrast visualization of the gastric body, pylorus, and the duodenal bulb, retrogastric, gastric portion of the duodenum and the jejunum. Um, you want to see the lower lung fields on a 14 by 17 to show any hernias. And the stomach centered at the level of the pylorus on a 10 by 12. So no rotation of the patient, and the technique shows the anatomy that you're looking for. So this picture here is probably a little bit low if you're doing on expiration. Um, you need to be centered probably about here in order to get up, um, at least go to nipple line um, so that you can see the um, any kind of reflux or um, hernia. If there is reflux, you do want to see how high it goes and you don't want to have to do another exposure to see how high the reflux is. All right, so that looks more like it. So I would do that even though it's a 14 by 17. So this is a 10 by 12. This is a 14 by 17, but this is still too low. I think it needs to be up here so that you can catch the reflux and you can see the small bowel both, where here the centering is right, but it should be down a little bit lower. All right. Um, Looking here, this is your AP. So you can see here they went higher than what they displayed on the image here. So it needs to be higher. So you can see we've got all the stomach. We can't really see if there's reflux. I probably sneak it up. I like it like this. This is pretty. Um, this is what I want to see to check for reflux. This is a little low. Um, it's hard to check for reflux with that. All right, so this has a hernia which is interesting here because here is your diaphragm. You can see the arrow pointing to your diaphragm and your stomach up into the thoracic cavity. So not good. And then here is a lateral uh, view where you can see the diaphragm and you can see the stomach up above the diaphragm. Uh, if there's any esophageal cancer, they'll actually take the esophagus and they'll move, they'll remove it and bring the stomach up into the thoracic cavity. So getting a history is really important. So um, this here is a good image looking. Um, no evidence of hernia, which is good. So we're checking for reflex on this um, image. Whereas here on this image, you can see that we have um, Ruge right there. So here's the diaphragm and we've got stomach up into the uh, thoracic cavity. So this is a sliding hiatal hernia. And in the pathology class, you're going to learn about a sliding hiatal hernia and a paraesophageal hernia. Okay, so the last one for this uh, PowerPoint is the small intestines. So um, you can administer barium or other types of um, radiopaque contrast uh, orally. Reflex filling via large volume barium enema, that is not a fun way to go. I don't recommend doing that. And then there's direct injection via a tube placed into the small bowel termed intercolysis. And I'll explain to you um, the different intercolysis. So the oral method is the most common, thank goodness. All right, so the prep, um, low, low residual or soft foods for two days before the study, food and fluid withheld the evening and meal on the day before the exam, breakfast is withheld on the day of the exam, and um, cleansing enema for colon may be administered. We want the patient cleaned out pretty good. The, uh, it's termed small bowel series because several identical images are produced over a period of time. So each image identified with a time marker indicating um, its interval since the ingestion of barium. So when you give the patient a cup of barium to start drinking, um, you need to mark the time. So if you're doing an esophagram, an upper GI, and a small bowel follow through, you need to pay attention to when they take their first drink of barium. So that's when time starts. 
So you obtain the images with the patient either supine or prone, depending on the patient can do prone. So when we do supine, we take uh, advantage of the superior and lateral shift of the stomach, which provides visualization of the duodenum and jejunum, and it prevents compression uh, of overlapping loops of bowel. So when we use prone, we do it to compress the abdomen to increase image quality. And what it does is it spreads out the bowel so we can see it really well. It's not as many loops overlying each other. It's, it's spread out. But you have to be cognizant of that. The patient lays down. You're going to be clipping off the sides of the abdomen if you're still going lengthwise and they've got a pretty big belly. So make sure you don't clip off the loops of bowel. You may have to do two crosswise. Okay, first image is usually taken 15 minutes after the start of drinking of the barium. The next interval um, varies between 15 minutes and 30 minutes depending on how fast it's going. Um, there are markers um, that you can use that are uh, lead to put on your image or you can annotate. Make sure that you do put something on there to let the radiologist know the time sequence. Um, the radiologist looks at every image. Um, as you become better and the radiologist trusts you, um, they'll say, let me know when you get to the terminal ileum. And then you just let them know when it gets all the way to the large bowel. And then they'll look at all the images. But typically they want to see them every 30 minutes or so. So when the barium reaches the ileocecal region, um, the doctor will come in with a compression paddle typically and take images of the terminal ileum, make sure there's no pathology in there like Crohn's or anything else. Um, typically it's two hours after the ingestion of barium. Um, <laughs> if there's any kind of obstruction, it can be days. So two hours is high hopes. All right, so the projections that you're going to do is PA or AP. Uh, you're going to put the patient supine or prone. Then you're going to be MSP is centered for 30-minute intervals. You're going to center the IR at the level of L2. For delayed images, you're going to center at the crest, just like you would for normal KUB. All right, so perpendicular to the midpoint of the IR is your CR. You're going to be collimated to the patient, and you're going to expose at expiration. We are looking for proper collimation, the entire small in, uh, intestines on each image, and that's the biggest reason why I have failed so many of you guys on a small bowel study, is you're clipping off the intestines. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? We're doing a small bowel study. Why are you clipping? If the patient's wide, you need to do two crosswise. You can't get away with clipping off the small bowel on a small bowel study. It's just not going to happen. So make sure that if you're doing a small bowel study, you get all of the small bowel on it. Don't clip the small bowel off. All right, so um, you want to put the stomach on the first couple images. Um, you want a time marker on there. You want the vertebral column centered on the image. And sometimes if it's all over on the left side, I'll sneak my image over to the left side. Um, I don't care about the right side as it doesn't have any barium in it. I'm looking at the barium filled loops of bowel. So when it moves over to the right side, I may shift it over and get the right side. So you're going to start up with your centering being higher and for your first like 30 minutes of films and then you're going to go down to your crest. If the patient's not moving, the um, barium's not moving through the patient and it's still all up in the stomach, don't clip the stomach off and get down lower just because it says, you know, oh, after 30 minutes you're supposed to be down at the crest. Yes, you're supposed to move down at the crest if the patient's moving through properly. The patient's not moving and it's all, all up in the upper abdomen, you're going to want to stay centered where the barium is. You're following the barium through the patient, okay? And um, you want to make sure that the exposure technique is right and that the exam is done once it reaches the cecum. So here is your centering, easy stuff. So you're going to make sure you get all of it on your first uh, 30 minutes worth of films. And then, um, as you can see, it's moving through. Um, you need to make sure that you, you can clip the top of the stomach after you get the first 30 minutes of it to make sure you get the bottom. So, um, here you can see as we've gone through, this is jejunum. You can see how feathery it is, where this is ileum, where it's not as feathery and it's a lot smaller. And then we've come into the cecum. So here's your ascending colon, here's your cecum. 
and then the doctor will come in and do spot films of the terminal ilium. So they'll look here at the ilium and then look at the ileocecal valve coming into the cecum. And they'll, they'll try to get images of the appendix if they can. So they'll do spot films to make sure there's no pathology in here like Crohn's. Okay, so this is a retrograde exam. So this is using a barium enema and um, getting it up into the small bowel. Sometimes when you do a barium enema, the ile uh, ileocecal valve is bad, so it'll reflux into the small bowel. Um, this is pretty crazy and seems pretty painful to me. I don't recommend doing these. <laughs> There's other ways to do it that are better. So this is anercholiasis. Um, what we do is we'll typically drop um, an NG tube line in and then we'll hand inject in methylcellulose um, at a high rate of speed. We'll inject, 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 um, and we'll dilate the small bowel loops and we can see if there's any kind of pathology in them. As you can see, they're pretty radiolucent. We can see through them pretty well here. Um, this here is an air contrast anercholysis. So you do one of the barium or, or um, methylcellulose and one of air. Um, yeah, fun. As you can see here, anercholysis with iodinated material. And we put a balloon in here and blew up a balloon here to keep it from backflowing. So um, a lot of the times the patients will start to throw up all the contrast media we're injecting. So if you put a balloon in there, it seals it off so that we can fill the um, small intestines. Um, we can do it in CT, so we'll give them a special kind of contrast, methylcellulose typically, and we have them drink a bottle every 15 minutes of contrast for, the, for an hour, so four bottles in an hour, and then we'll put them in the scanner, and this is what we get. We get real nice dilated small bowel loops in here, so we like that. We can also do it in MRI, and we do the same protocol. We give them methylcellulose, and we'll have them uh, drink a bottle every 15 minutes, it's a lot, trust me, and it's stuff is real slimy. So you can see the dilated bowel loops here really well. So this is this is with barium. This was done with barium. Uh, this was done with methylcellulose. It's a negative contrast. So instead of it being bright white, it's black, and it shows us the the bowel wall really well. So you can see here there's a tumor there that's causing a blockage. You can see the dilated loops here and the healthy bowel wall until you get to this point. So. Here's using a different sequence um, with the methylcellulose. We tag the methylcellulose, and you can see the tumor in here that's causing the obstruction. So it's a pretty cool uh, study to do. Uh, we have to use IV contrast to see the bowel wall. So um, in CT also, we're supposed to use IV contrast if we're using the methylcellulose because it is a negative contrast. And in order to see the integrity of the bowel wall, we've got to give the IV contrast. Okay, so. There you go. There's your positioning. So um, typically for an esophagram, we'll do um, LPO, right lateral, REO. For an upper GI, we'll do LPO, right lateral, REO, AP, and PA. And then for a small bowel, we'll just do timed images typically every 15 minutes that go to every hour, depending on the study. All right. We'll do large bowel positioning next.